Uh, good morning. That's loud. I'm Sean Killing, one of the elders here at Southside Bible Church. We want to welcome you this morning, uh, especially if you are a guest and haven't been here this morning. We want to uh, again welcome you, and we pray that it's a blessing to you this morning. Um, we preach Christ and Him crucified here, and we hope that it is uh, indeed a blessing. Um, you end up blessing people in ways you don't even know. I heard just this morning, I won't say details to keep them um, safe, but apparently they like when I preach because I'm an easier target to cover. So um, that's good, I guess. Um, like, where is he? Where is that guy? If you would open up uh, to Malachi, we're going to start a four week series on the book of Malachi. And I have the privilege of opening it up for us this morning and introducing it. The four chapters, and we'll do one chapter a week. So I'm going to start with this question, and that is, does it matter how we worship? And I know with a lot of people, that's kind of a hot-button topic. Do we do hymns? Do we do choruses? Do we do liturgies? Do we say amen in the middle of the service? How do we worship? Does it matter? Does God care? How do we live when our circumstances lead us to bad conclusions about God? It's not a question. What does true hope look like? These are just some of the questions I hope that we're going to answer over this four-week series as we go through this book in Malachi. And I'm not going to do the old tired joke that he is my favorite Italian prophet, Malachi. Not going to do that. But he is my favorite Hawaiian prophet, Malachi. So you have that. So the book of Malachi is situated as the last book of the Old Testament in our English Bibles, and rightly so. Because after Malachi gives this oracle, there's really silence until you get to the New Testament. And so it's situated perfectly, I think. It contains what can only be described as a dialogue or a disputation between the covenant God, Yahweh, and the attitude of his people culminating in what will end up being the greatest news the world has ever heard. And so the date for this book is roughly 450 to 500 years before the birth of Christ, and no one knows with certainty, but most put the book somewhere between 500 B.C. and 425 B.C. for various reasons. We know that it has to be at least after 516, because that's when the reconstruction of the temple was completed since there's an implied existence of the temple as Malachi addresses. We also find reference to a governor, a term which was used during the Persian period, so that sits in that date as well. There are extensive, there are extensive parallels between Ezra and Nehemiah and all the sins they rebuked, and so either he was a contemporary of Ezra and Nehemiah or he was right before they came. I think he was probably after Ezra came and maybe before Nehemiah. That's where I would put it. In fact, because Malachi means my messenger, that's what his name means, some have determined that due to a lack of biography information about him, that Malachi shouldn't even be read as a personal name at all. He was just the messenger, that was the title. In fact, some even think that Malachi was a pseudonym, a pen name for Ezra the prophet. Calvin stated this, in fact, he said, I am more disposed to grant that what some have said that he was Ezra, and that Malachi was his surname, for God had called him to do great and remarkable things. I don't find any strong evidence either way for that. I think it should just be read as a personal name, and I'm going to take it that way. And so here's the context for the book. It sits at a time in history, after the Babylonian exile, when many nations were allowed to return to their homeland, rebuild Persiris in 538. And so here we see a post-exilic people, God's people. And though they are back in their land, which God promised to do for them, and at least the temple has been rebuilt by this point, things are not great. All the hope that was promoted by Haggai in recounting the Lord's deeds, all the visions of Zechariah that promoted this hope had faded by now. In fact, there were still more Jews living outside of Judah than there were inside of it. 
They were no longer a great nation with a king, but a mere, in what one study called, postage, postage stamp sized province, one among 20. It seemed as if the great God of the nation had been reduced to the level of other local territorial gods, if he in fact dared to show himself at all. The land of milk and honey was anything but. Drought, economic hardship, taxation to a foreign power, pestilence, neighbors who were bullies, and a general sense of failed promises characterized the mindset. There was religious tolerance by the Persians. They were allowed to worship, but only so far as it benefited them. In fact, Yahud, as they called it, or Judah, along with her neighboring allies or her provinces, really served as nothing more than a base against Egypt if they so needed it for the Persians. And life for the Jews was anything but the extraordinary existence of God's special chosen people. You wouldn't know they were God's special chosen people had you lived there at the time. And in a word, their existence could be summed up with one word, which is lackadaisical. And so this morning, I'm going to take you through chapter 1, and there's no way we can be exhaustive. I wish we had time to do that, but we don't. But I want to tell you the story. I love the Old Testament because it always tells a story. Now, don't get me wrong, I like the New Testament too. I've heard there's some good things in there, right? But even as much as I'm not really an outline guy, I don't do outlines, I actually made one for the sermon. So this is rare for me. So here it is. So first we're going to look at covenantal love, then covenantal laziness, followed by covenantal Lord, and then finally we'll wrap up with some application. So love, laziness, Lord, and then application this morning. And so in summing up chapter 1, one commentator used a phrase that I think describes the chapter so well, it's something I can't get out of my head. As soon as I read it, this has been with me every day since I started studying for this. And it's this question. If God doesn't care, why should we? That sums it up perfectly. If God doesn't care, why should we? That was the attitude. A more chilling description you wouldn't be able to find. I'm going to say it one more time because I'm going to return to it at the end of the sermon. If God doesn't care, why should we? You see where the blame is put there? And we see this from the very first verse even. The oracle of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. And that word oracle usually, most of the time means prophecy, but here it actually means burden. It doesn't necessarily mean strict prophecy here. It means burden. The burden of the word of Yahweh to his people Israel. So he's letting him know that what I'm about to tell you is important. There is something terribly wrong with what's going on here. There exists a relationship, but it's fractured and it's broken. And that is the burden that Malachi is going to relate to them. There is an author, Yahweh, there's a recipient, Israel. Now, if you know your history, that would sound strange at this time because the northern kingdom, who was known as Israel, had been exiled, scattered to the point of really disappearing completely. And the true people here referred to as the southern kingdom of Judah, made up of that tribe of Judah, Benjamin, and then some Levites. But he uses this name Israel for a reason because that was the covenant name of Jacob. And along with it came all these promises. The covenant name for the nation. And we're going to see that God uses his covenant name to address them. So there's a theme here. So there's also the messenger, Malachi. Now they pointed out, some don't even know if that's a, a real personal name as much as it is a title. And I think God did that on purpose in this book. Because the point here isn't the messenger, at least not yet, it's the message. Toward the end of the book, another messenger is going to come and be talked about, but you have to wait for four weeks to see that. So here's how he basically starts. Israel, my people, there is something wrong. And now we're going to dispute about it. And here's how it starts. I have loved you, says the Lord, but you say, how have you loved us? Can you imagine the gall? God's people saying this? How have you loved us? 
being led into captivity because of their sin, with the promise that Yahweh was going to bring them back, and he did, true to his word, exactly at the time when he said he would do it, and that's their attitude? You love us? Prove it. Sure looks like it. Sure feels like it. Have you not noticed what it looks like for us, God? One commentator put it this way. He said, there was a clash between the expectations and the experience in the Yahweh-Israel covenantal relationship. They expected certain things, but what they were experiencing was quite different. The expectation is this, that they would be a free nation, not just a province among many, that their Messiah would burst upon the scene. But as of yet, no sign of God's presence. The temple they had rebuilt was just a shell of its former self, both in its glory and the fact, more importantly, that its chief resident was absent. There was no manifestation of God there as there was in the former days. So that was their attitude. Yeah, sure, okay. You say you've loved us, but we don't see it. But the counterclaim actually does something worse than just question here. It doesn't just ask for evidence of God's love for them. Prove it, God. It actually goes further. It assumes that not only is his love absent, but in fact their circumstances lead them to the opposite conclusion that he actually hates them. In essence, their claim is this, to God's professed love, loved us, all evidence to the contrary. It's not that you just have forgotten about us. You probably hate us. That's the force of what they're asking here, or what they're saying. Now, one might think at this point, if you were a human, the Yahweh would just recite to them the many, many, many ways that he has demonstrated his love to them. How good he has been to them. The ways that he had blessed them. Maybe the fact that he hasn't just wiped them off the face of the earth completely. Some sort of checklist, right? That's what we do. Prove it. Okay? I've done this. I've done that. I've done this. I've done that. And he just runs through the list of the positive things that you've done. But God doesn't answer them in that way, does he? If you keep going in the chapter. Here's how he answers. It's very strange. Is not Esau Jacob's brother, declares the Lord? Yet I have loved Jacob, but Esau I have hated. I have laid waste his hill country and left his heritage to jackals of the desert. If Edom says, we are shattered, but we will, re we will rebuild the ruins, the Lord of hosts says, they may build, but I will tear down. And they will be called the wicked country and the people with whom the Lord is angry forever. Your own eyes, Israel, shall see this. And you shall say, great is the Lord beyond the border of Israel. And so he answers not by recounting his goodness to them, which he could have done, but of his hatred towards Esau and Edom. Only God could give such proof, right? That wouldn't work for any of us. So here's, here's some marriage advice, okay? This is for free. This is just free counsel. You cannot answer your wife the same way that God answered Israel. Okay? When your wife says, prove that you love me, you can't say, well, I rejected all the other women. <laughs> hmm? Not only have I rejected them, I've destroyed their inheritance. So, of course I love you. That doesn't work, right? So don't do that. Amen. It just sounds arrogant. But he roots his argument and his love for them in the doctrine of sovereign election. And we've talked about that in Romans, right? When Ken went through that in Romans 9. His choice of one brother, because that's where it starts, Jacob I loved, Esau I hated, over the other, one brother over the other, ancestors of these two nations. Twin brothers, to be exact. Which demonstrated that God's choice of one over the other rested purely in his will and not in anything that they had done. In fact, that's what Paul picks up on Romans 9. He says, and that not only so, but also when Rebekah had conceived children by one man, our forefather Isaac, though they were not yet born, had done nothing, either good or bad. Nothing. One way or the other. In order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls, she was told the older will serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. 
There was nothing about Jacob or the nation of Israel that would commend them to God for him to love them, except for his choice of them. It was the truth that these Israelites, these Jews had forgotten at this time. And that laid the foundation for doubts and downright skepticism regarding God's claim to love them. After all, it was the nation of Edom, if you remember, the descendants of Esau, who committed violent crimes against Israel as they were being carried away in exile. Know what Obadiah records. Because of the violence done to your brother Jacob, shame shall cover you, and you shall be cut off forever. On the day that you stood aloof, on the day that strangers carried off his wealth and foreigners entered his gates and cast lots for Jerusalem, you were like one of them. But do not go out over the day of your brother in the day of his misfortune. Do not rejoice over the people of Judah in the day of their ruin. Do not boast in the day of distress. And so as Jerusalem is being ransacked, his arch enemy, Edom, is watching and laughing, clapping, well done, well done, Babylon, you get them. And they bullied them. So how could God claim to love them? Esau was at least as good off as they were at this point. They too were destroyed by the Babylonians. They took over everything. And yet, notice what God says regarding them. I have laid waste his hill country. He had given them Seir, a mountain country. And when Israel was going through, he says, you don't touch it. And why? Because of this. Because at some point, God was going to show he's going to lay waste to their whole thing. If Edom says, we are shattered, we will rebuild. The Lord says, they may build, but I will tear down. But again, Israel couldn't see it. They thought God had failed them. Turn tail and run. Haggai had promised that once the temple had been rebuilt, wealth would abound. He says this, And I will shake all nations so that the treasures of all nations shall come in, and I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord. But where was it? Temples rebuilt. How come we're in poverty? In fact, they were paying taxes to a foreign power to support them. It was quite the opposite. They were anything but wealthy, as the rest of the book will demonstrate. There was social injustice going on, and, and my brothers will get into that as we go through the book. Ezekiel had promised the restoration of the Davidic covenant. So he, this is what he told them. And I will set up over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he shall feed them. He shall feed them and be their shepherd, and I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David shall be a prince among them. I am the Lord, I have spoken. But right now, even after returning to their land, there was no king. They were just one of 20 provinces under the Persian Empire named Yehud, and they were struggling to survive. Where at one point, the, the province was no bigger than 20 by 30 miles, if that. Now sometimes... We are so consumed by our trials and our hardships that we can't recognize what God is doing and fulfilling his promises because it doesn't look the way it's supposed to look. God had an enduring covenant love for Israel. He declared it, first of all, through divine revelation. Second, he said, Esau, I have hated, in contrast. And note that this contrast is not quantitative. Despite what you've been told or what you've read, it does not mean just love less. You cannot get that out of the language. It's qualitatively different, not quantitatively different. God would be angry with that nation forever, he says. And as Malachi just stated, they would never rebuild and have it last, ever. The language he uses here for that is very descriptive. He, I think he's alluding here to Jeremiah 9.11. He's using language so that Israel would know what he was talking about. And Jeremiah 9 says this, I will make Jerusalem a heap of ruins, a lair of jackals, and I will make the cities of Judah a desolation without inhabitant. So they understood perfectly well what God was saying there about Edom. The Jews would have recognized that language because that prophecy initially was about them. So by using the same language, God was saying, it, Edom is not going to escape my judgment. Don't worry about that. Their inheritance will be left to the jackals, 
most often a symbol of desolation, undesirable creatures, most often like dog-like creatures who just roamed around, but also could just literally mean monsters. So there's a spiritual element to that, that once God was done with Edom, it would be left to the wild animals, to the monsters, to spiritual desolation, never to be inhabited again. In fact, it was this type of place, I think, that Mark was referring to when he writes that the Spirit immediately drove Jesus out into, and I quote, and he was in the wilderness 40 days being tempted by Satan, and and he was with the wild animals, and the angels were ministering to him. That's the wilderness that Jesus went into, not necessarily Edom itself, but that type of idea, that he went into spiritual isolation, desolation, where nothing was there except evil. But here was the difference. After their punishment, because the covenant did not exclude punishment, remember, if they obeyed, uh, they would be blessed. If they didn't obey, they'd be punished. Judah would be graciously restored. That's what he promised. Edom's punishment was permanent, irreversible, and without hope. I hope you see that difference. Eventually, what ends up happening is this tribe of Arabs known as the uh, the Matians pushed Edom out of their country, and it was left to ruins. These people that pushed them out were actually semi-nomadic, and so they would move from place to place, but they never bothered to rebuild the cities. They just let their herds graze there, and so the the cities were just left in ruins. That's what ended up happening to Edom. So that's the second thing. Third, the temple had been rebuilt. The priests were serving in it. How have you loved us? You You rebuilt the temple. I'll let you come back and rebuild the temple. The priests were serving it, albeit poorly. The fact that it stood demonstrated that God was faithful and kept his word. Yet despite all of these things, their question remained, how have you loved us? That was the mindset of the Jews at the time. See, they were plagued by bad theology. Their view of God was inadequate incorrect and downright almost blasphemous. That is why theology is so important because bad thinking leads to bad behavior. Bad thinking leads to bad behavior and we're going to see some terrible behavior here shortly. And so that leads us to the second point which is covenantal laziness. Again, if God doesn't care, why should we? If God isn't going to be faithful, why should we be faithful? Now go to verse 6. Now it's God's turn to level some charges. He says, A son honors his father and a servant his master. If then I am a father, where is my honor? And if I am a master, where is my fear? Says the Lord of hosts to you, O priests, who despise my name. Yahweh was indeed the father of of Israel. He created them, he called them, he delivered them, he took care of them as his own son. It was indisputable that they should give honor to God as their father. In fact, it was written in their own law, you shall honor your father and your mother. He was also their master who ruled over them, but they had rejected him. And it wasn't just a mere apathy, a lack of honor as father and master, but in fact, they went the other way. It says that they despise his name. They offered the worst kind of scorn, showed not just neglect of showing honor, but contempt. It's one thing to just turn a blind eye and say, I'm not going to give you what is due. It's another thing to turn and say, you are a terrible God. And that's what they were doing. And at this point, notice he's not talking broadly. He's now narrowed it down to the priests. They were supposed to be the teachers. The worship leaders. And they were leading the bad theology. And I'll have more to say to them specifically in chapter 2. So of course they take severe umbrage to this. They say, how have we despised your name? Outrage. How dare you, God, tell us that. Prove it. We've despised your name. You forgot about us. They were outraged because that's a serious offense. If you despise the name, you despise his very being, his character, his essence. 
In fact, it was a direct reversal of how the priests were supposed to function. In that Arianic blessing in number 627, it states this, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And then it ends like this. So shall they put my name upon the people of Israel, and I will bless them. But instead of putting his name upon the people, they were despising the name in front of the people. So in response to the rebuttal, how we despise your name, God says this, by offering polluted food upon my altar. Then they responded, how have we polluted you? They despised his name. What are you talking about? You ask for sacrifices, we bring you sacrifices. What more do you want? So he continues, when you offer blind animals and sacrifices, is that not evil? When you offer those that are lame or sick, is that not evil? They had fallen into a terrible pattern of worship because their idea of him was terrible and lazy. They thought they could just scoot by haphazardly, just bring whatever you wanted. And in fact, they probably thought they were killing two birds with one stone. Not only did we get to rid our flocks of the things that weren't desirable to keep anyway, we get credit for worship. That's efficiency. Or so they thought. So what's the problem there? Well, the problem was that the animals that they were offering were not acceptable sacrifices. So many people are offended by a holy and precise God. We don't like that. When God says, you come to me this way and this way only, how dare he tell us that? How, God, how, how dare God tells people how to approach him? As if we should have a say in the matter. The truth is people are never allowed to come to God in, a, in any way they see fit. And that's what they were doing. God commanded purity and acceptable sacrifice because his name is worthy of it. And the covenant, here's, here's the kicker. They knew the covenant and the covenant was very precise. Leviticus 22 Animals blind or disabled or mutilated or having a discharge or an itch or scabs, you shall not offer to the Lord or give them to the Lord as a food offering on the altar. Or Deuteronomy says this, but if it, the animal, has any blemish, if it is lame or blind or has any serious blemish, whatever, you shall not sacrifice it to the Lord your God. How have you polluted it? Not just by offering what you wanted, by offering the very things I expressly forbid you to offer. Don't bring this, and you brought it. And it's no coincidence, I was telling Ken this last week, that he preached from Romans 12.1 before he left on vacation. Lest we think that this is only an Old Testament Jewish problem. So Paul writes there, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Ken said he was concerned with those who were trying to crawl off the altar. My concern is, what are you putting on it? It's going to get uncomfortable for a minute, I'm just warning you. Is it polluted? Are you giving God the best or the best of what's left over? Those things which are convenient. I'll give you Sunday mornings, God. I'll greet the people. I'll teach the people. I'll serve the coffee. I'll work in the soundboard. I'll work in the nursery. I'll sit and listen quietly to the word being preached. You have it all for three hours. But the rest of the week, that's mine. Are you coming here Sunday mornings without your heart? Is any excuse good enough not to show up and worship? And things happen, we understand that. But many put more effort into their hair, or their beard as the case may be, than they do the worship of the holy God. 
Again, we have this plague called bad thinking. The world has been told for so long now, come as you are. And that's true. But you're not to remain as you are. Post-exilic Israel was doing just enough to get by. So the question is, how about you? Are you also despising the name and his worship by bringing polluted, maimed, blind, blemish sacrifices? He says, I am Yahweh. I am Jehovah. And this is what you bring? He goes on. Present that to your governor. Will he accept you or show you favor, says Lord of hosts? First of all, ouch. The stuff you're bringing me, try offering that to your governor. See if he shows you favor. A little jab showing that they were under still Persian rule. And second of all, it wasn't even good enough for a mere mortal. Not even a mere human, a non-God honoring governor of Persia would accept this garbage. Yet you think to bring it to the Holy One of Israel? You think that'll go well for you? You think that brings honor to my name and my place of worship? But here's the thing. It was more than just imperfect ceremonial boo-boos, oopsies. It was an entire attitude. That was the problem. The irony is even more thick. They were willingly bringing to God what they knew no mere human governor would accept. It wasn't like they didn't have a choice, like all they had was blind and blemished animals. No, they were making a mockery of worship. They were like Uzzah and the ark, who thought that his hand was more holy than the dirt God created. Ever turn in a project at work that was rifled with errors, lazy, half put together? That go well for you? But even beyond the irony is the hypocrisy. Verse 9. And now, entreat the favor of God that he may be gracious to us. With such a gift from our hand, will he show favor to any of you, says the Lord of hosts? You think this is going to earn you favor? You bring what you know a human governor would despise, and you bring that same gift, and you think that'll cause Yahweh to be gracious to you? In those famous words of R.C. Sproul, what is wrong with you people? In fact, it gets even worse. Verse 10. Oh, that there were one among you who would shut the doors, that you might not kindle fire on my altar in vain. I have no pleasure in you, says Lord of hosts, and I will not accept an offering from your hand. I want that to sink in for a second. The God of the universe who not only requires worship, deserves worship, prescribes worship, says, you know what? Shut it down. Lock the temple doors. I'd rather have no worship than the garbage you're bringing me. This is God saying this, who's worthy to be worshiped, who demands that we worship, and he says, lock the doors. I don't want you in here anymore if this is what you're going to bring me. For all intents and purposes, the message was, Israel is now closed. Their very existence centered on their God and the worship of him. And the fact that God says, oh, that there were even one among you shows how far the corruption went. Will no one put an end to this? Will no one stand up and say, this isn't right? God had made a declaration, I have loved Jacob, but Esau I hated. But here he states, I have no pleasure in you, his chosen people. I think most of us know what it's like to disappoint a leader or a parent, a teacher, a boss. It's not a good feeling. And if you think that by offering that garbage you're offering will earn you favor, think again. I will not accept it. Now that, for Israel, for the Jews, should have made the hair in their neck stand up. I will not accept it. Because if he won't accept their sacrifices... Small. 
If they will not accept their sacrifices, what were they going to do about their sin? You thought about that? I will not accept it. Well, now they have a problem because now they have no way to atone for their sin. Anyone still doubt that God takes his worship seriously? You think they thought God cared now? But he continues to stick it to them. For from the rising of the sun to its setting, my name will be great among the nations. And in every place, incense will be offered to my name and a pure offering. Again, ouch. For my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. So he makes his contrast between the insulting worship being offered by his own people with what will one day be the world over, which is making his name great. And pure offerings will be given. You're supposed to be my priest. And guess what? The nations, they're going to be the ones offering pure offering. Can you imagine being a Jew? Not to mention a son of Aaron and hearing that. The nations would offer pure offerings. God promises back in Isaiah 66, 21, talking about the nations, he says, and some of them also I will take for priests and for Levites, says the Lord. Hear that? He's going to take people from other nations and make them priests. Couple that with what Peter says. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. Once you were not a people, now you are God's people. But compared to the nations that God, in whom God's name will be great, God says to them in verse 12, but you, you profane it. When you say that the Lord's table is polluted and its fruit, that is the food, its food may be despised. Not that they were literally saying that. Nobody's going to come out outright and say that. However, actions speak louder than words, don't they? Not only was their worship corrupt, but worship in general had become a burden to them. Verse 13. But you say, what a weariness this is. And you snort at it, says Lord of hosts. Think there's a problem here? The very means by which they had access to God had become wearisome, burdensome, and contemptible. Something they turned their noses up at. This is how they interacted with God, and they thought it was too much. They had turned what should have been a delight into a burden, a drudgery. Can you believe we have to do this every day? Bring these stinking animals up here? Offering them sacrifice, and boy, is that God picky. He ought to be grateful that we do this at all for him. That was the attitude. See, the focus now is not just on the priest, but also on the people, because they were the ones bringing the sacrifices, but the priests were the ones who were supposed to be inspecting and offering up the sacrifices. And when something was brought to them, they were supposed to say, that is not acceptable. But instead, they were saying, sure. In fact, there's evidence that there was probably bribes going on. Give me a little extra, and we'll, we'll make this one work. You say it's wearisome. Well, I'm sorry that appeasing God for your sin is so inconvenient. So again, is there a lesson here for us? God has provided the means of having your sin forgiven. And because of that, we're here on Sunday morning to worship. But is it a burden for you? Much rather stay in bed this morning? Is it inconvenient? Is it boring? To sit here and God even give God even just three hours a week? Again, I'm sorry that the greatest news ever proclaimed is so inconvenient for some of you. Spurgeon said this, When we listen to the reading of the word of God or the preaching of his truth, shall that be a weariness? Yes. When we have no part or lot in it. When it is like reading a will in which we have no legacy. But if the gospel we preach is our gospel, the gospel of our salvation, we have a share in it, 
What can inspire our soul with joy? If God had been weary of us, we need not have wondered. But we ought to blush and be silent for shame because we have wearied of him. And he ends with this. Are we tired of God? I'm going to come back to that. So go back to verse 13 now. God recounts again what he's already charged them with. You bring what has been taken by violence or is lame or sick, and this you bring as your offering. Shall I accept that from your hand, says the Lord? No. Rather, cursed be the cheat who has a male in his flock and vows it and yet sacrifices to the Lord what is blemished. For I am a great king, says the Lord of hosts, and my name will be feared among the nations. So not only will God ex- not accept garbage worship, but those who bring it, he calls cheats. And they will be cursed. Can you imagine bringing something that you think is supposed to automatically just get you favor with God, and instead of it bringing favor, it actually brings a curse? And that's not even the worst thing God says to him. But I'll leave that for Brian next week. Despite not showing honor to him as a father or as a master, he reminds them, and it doesn't change the fact that he is the great king. It's almost like he's had enough. I'm tired of disputing with you, Israel. I am king. I am worthy, and my name will be great among the nations, whether you do it or not. So now this goes for some application. I'm going to go to that question at the very beginning, at the start of the chapter the one that summed up the attitude at the time. If God doesn't care, why should we? But that's the thing. The attitude was based on a false premise because God did care. God does care. They assumed he didn't because of their circumstances, but in fact, he cared so much that he was going to demonstrate his love by what he was going to do to their arch enemy, first of all. He cared so much that he would rather have worship shut down completely and the temple locked up than to let that insulting garbage keep coming in. He cared so much that one day, and I'm sorry to steal the thunder here from my brother Sean and Brian and Greg here, but he cared so much that one day one would come in whom Yahweh would have pleasure. One of whom it would be said, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. A son who would be a great high priest, who would not be corrupt, who would not be lazy, but one who would say, zeal for your house or the temple consumes me. A son, unlike these post-exilic Jews, who would honor his father. A son who said, but I do as the father has commanded me so that the world may know that I love the father. Spoiler alert, it's Jesus. A true son, a true priest who didn't find offering a sacrifice wearisome and snored at it, but took it so seriously that the same priest was God himself who came to dwell with men to offer it. If you want something done right, you got to do it yourself. And God said, I'll do it. Who carried his sacrifice up a lonely hill called Golgotha. And it wasn't a wearisome thing to him, but he did it for the joy that was set before him. And he fulfilled his duty until he was able to say, it is finished. A priest who didn't bring a blind sacrifice, a lame or sick sacrifice, a blemished sacrifice, but a lamb without spot or blemish. A sacrifice that was acceptable, so acceptable as a matter of fact, that no sacrifice was ever needed again, ever in the history of mankind. That's how good it was. As we heard in the opening scripture this morning from Hebrews, but when Christ appeared as the high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and bulls, and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer, sanctified for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself 
without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. His name is great among the nations, a name that we read is above every name. And so the question, if God doesn't care, why should we, should be rephrased to, God does care, do you? You know, I, I, I make jokes. And I appreciate that people come up and they laugh and they say, no, that was, that was funny. How do you think of those things? And I'm grateful for that. A bad joke that nobody laughs at isn't worth telling. But you know what I want more than people laughing at my jokes? I want you to care about your faith. Do you care? Do you have that same attitude this morning that makes you think God doesn't care? And, and I, I, I get it. There, there are a lot of hard things going on. I'm not saying circumstances are easy. They never are. That's what might tempt you this morning to say things like, if God cared, I wouldn't be struggling financially. If God cared, I wouldn't have a broken marriage. If God cared, I wouldn't have lost a child. If God cared, I wouldn't have cancer. If God cared, I wouldn't be bullied. If God cared, I wouldn't be lonely. Don't let your circumstances determine your theology. The way the post-exilic Jews did. God cares. You know how I know he cares? Because right now he has you in this room, in that seat, listening to the gospel. Maybe you've never worshipped God a day in your life. Maybe you've been phoning it in for years. God cares. He's given you this book He's made plain the way of escape. He's told you how to live a life that's not devoid of meaning. He's provided a way to deal with your guilt. But here's the catch. He says that today is the day of salvation. Not tomorrow. Not in a week after you have time to kind of mull things over that have been said and listening to the arguments and weighing like, okay, that sounds, that sounds good. It makes more sense than the alternative. He doesn't say that. He says, today. Today is the day of redemption. Today is the day to redeem the worship. And so we say, how have you loved us, God? He gave us Christ. How have you loved us? Because I did everything necessary so that you might have life. Not terrible, wasteful, garbage worship sacrifices. I provided the best, my only son. That's how much I care. Not only did it have to be done right, it had to be done perfectly. And he did. Praise God. Today, if you've been phoning it in, no more. If you've never worshipped God a day in your life, today's the day. If you have been, then I hope that this message blesses you and you want to keep doing that. That it's exciting when you get up on Sunday morning saying, I get to go to the people of God and worship our great God with them. It's not wearisome, it's not a burden. Is a delight. Because the hope of heaven and being with him is worth all of it. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we are grateful for your word. We are grateful that you sent your son to die on our behalf, the most perfect, acceptable, without blemish sacrifice that we might have life. Father, it is available. We are grateful for that. I just pray that if there is anyone in this room who's never even heard these things before, that they would turn to you. I pray that those of us who have believed in you for years would, would find a freshness, a rejuvenation of just how holy and precise you are and then just thank you for 
fulfilling the, the conditions that, that needed to be met that people might be saved. Bless them, Father, and I just pray that you would keep us from error, keep us from becoming lackadaisical in our worship and in our hearts because you're worth far more than that. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.